But it's the statistic that goes with simple interpretation. Lists of alleles and thresholds. That's the information number that's used. In America and other countries, you can, cannot go to court without a match statistic. Uh, it's not admissible. You need to have some expression of error. But there are problems. Uh, this is a study from the US government almost 20 years ago that showed with simple two-person mixtures, uh, most labs called the results inconclusive. The labs that put a number to it ranged from tens of thousands, or one followed by four zeros, to hundreds of trillions, or one followed by 14 zeros. Clearly there's a problem if most labs think this is inconclusive, and the statistic is ranging over 10 orders of magnitude. It's a problem. That's what they were learning people do. Bias gets introduced. In most of science, you take your data, you put it into a computer, you get some results, and an expert can explain the results. Not with thresholds. Instead, you take the data. A person looks at the data. They apply thresholds. Something's in the list. Something's not in the list. They play with the data. Depending on the software, they might adjust dropout values. They might adjust thresholds. That can completely change the statistic. Then a person decides, is the defendant there or not? And uh, most protocols like this with thresholds, only after the analyst has chosen their data and has decided what the answer is, do they calculate a statistic. It's the exact opposite of most results. Um, NIST uh, introduced, uh, the FBI introduced something called stochastic thresholds in a paper in 2009 adopted by Swigdam in 2010 for human review. The paper they published had no data in it. There was no validation. It was just cartoons of what a protocol would be. Uh, this approach is to say if there's too much variation in the data, there's a lower threshold, the old one, there's a new threshold. They called it the stochastic threshold for randomness. If there's too much randomness, don't use that test. Throw out that one locus. The result was two-thirds of the loci were thrown out with mixtures. Mass statistics of a million became mass statistics of 100. The goal was to eliminate all false conclusions. That's what they wanted to happen, but it didn't happen. This did another study in 2013. At the expense of far more inconclusives and throwing out most of the information, on the study of 100 different labs on a three-person mixture, they found only six labs properly excluded one of the contributors. Uh, the other 25 in the middle called it inconclusive, and 70% of the labs said, this is informative, the person is there, here's a match statistic. Completely wrong. The person was never there. They were falsely including people, and their match statistics, as shown on the bottom, ranged over three or four orders of magnitude. But one of the labs that got the answer correct was using Truro, which is a South Carolina. Looking at actual data of human review, uh, I studied the correlation of CPI, which is the threshold statistic, locus by locus, with actual information, the log of the likelihood ratio. We found essentially no correlation. The R squared value, I think, was less than 0.20. And in this paper, we talked about what's really happening with CPI. It's not measuring rarity, it's not measuring information, it's just a fancy way of counting up how many tests, how many loci at which an analyst thinks somebody's included. Very sophisticated way of just counting, you could have counted the loci. So here we have a method that can't exclude people, it's not giving you information, and it's just putting a number to what a person already knows. That's not the best science. By 2015, once lawyers, even prosecutors, began hearing about all this confusion, uh, they started shutting down laboratories. Washington, D.C., Texas. How come the match statistics kept changing? Uh, the answer is, to a scientist, is the method of interpretation changed. You go from one threshold with average match statistics of a million down to two thresholds with average match statistics of 100. Of course, there'll be a change. That's very hard to explain to politicians, lawyers, and courts. Easier to shut down the lab and start again, at least in some states. So in summary, manual mixture interpretation suffers from these problems. 
is incomplete, data is discarded, not used, thresholds are applied. It's inaccurate. When you get an answer, it's, it's often, most often, inconclusive, uh, the number you get, the CPI value, will disagree with the true information. The method is subjective, but the protocols for CPI involve looking at the evidence data, looking at the suspect, and a person looking at the two together, and looking at the answer together with the data can cause problems. Um, it's inoperative. Hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of, of cases uh, produce no information is inconclusive. The method is opaque. We don't know what's going on in someone's head as they're thinking and making all these choices and adjusting parameters. And it's bias. It can only include, gives no answer, and most often it's inconclusive and cases aren't closed, at least from the forensic perspective. Enter the computer. Uh, so over 20 years ago, I invented this truly old computer technology. The concept of it is don't touch the data like the rest of statistical science. Instead, build models of how the data are formed from the PCR experiment and the, and the DNA genetic analyzer and explain the data in thousands or tens of thousands different ways and use that, the, that explanation uh, information that's reported as numbers together with Bayes' theorem to calculate probabilities just from the data. Don't look at the suspect, don't look at anybody. Just work from the data. Make a comparison afterwards. I can tell you a lot more. I'm not going to talk too much about Trulil, except to say that it's modern computing technology. It's over 20 years old. We, as scientists, we took it through 25 versions over 10 years until it worked on all of our test data from all of the labs and far surpassed what people could do to get right answers. You'll be seeing some validation studies as I'm talking uh, for both the scientists and the lawyers. So the result was a system that could use all the data, that's how it was designed, there's no thresholds. There have been at least 42 validation studies, eight published in peer-reviewed journals. There's no bias from looking at the defendant because the system doesn't know their profile. It's working out the answer for everyone, not just one person. We've uh, reported results in 46 of the 50 states. We've worked on the World Trade Center. Laboratories use it. Uh, we've consulted in about 400 agencies, mainly in the US, but also around the world. It's very transparent. You don't have to know what we're thinking. Uh, we give people the math. We let them test the software. We give four gigabytes of DVD of training videos papers, decisions, and software so people can test it. In science, the concept that I give you the tool and the data so you can test it yourself is the ultimate in transparency. Lawyers can argue against it because they have to argue, but as scientists, if you're given a method and a tool to test and you're given the data, that's your starting point, not empty words. And it's neutral. It can statistically include people or exclude people. That's how it has helped uh, defendants. The exclusion has helped with our exonerations and uh, innocence project work. And it's, the point is we're using information. We began publishing on the method over 20 years ago. The concept is variation from PCR measures identity. Uh, this paper is from the Journal of Forensic Sciences from 2001. Our patents, this method, Trulil is so old in terms of its concepts that our patents have long expired. It's, it's, this is not new technology. Uh, here is a listing of the peer-reviewed validation studies. Uh, almost all of them, anything we're first authors on, uh, are posted on our website, sidegen.com under the publications, uh, can make anything available to you. And I'll be talking about uh, some of these studies. And I can't tell you everything. That would be a complete course, just telling you what's in these papers. It actually would be an entire semester. But I can give you one key idea from each one as we go through. So here, in the journal Plus One, which is an open access journal, uh, we published on an information gap in DNA evidence interpretation. This was in 2009. The data came from the federal government, from NIST. They generated it. 
we interpret it with computers and with people uh, in different ways, made a comparison. What this figure is showing is a very important concept in science and law. There is a straight line linear relationship that lets you predict how much information you're going to get out of the DNA set. What do I mean? On the x-axis, on a logarithmic scale of say, picograms, 10, 100, 1,000, is the amount of DNA in one contributor of a mixture. So if you have five per people in a mixture, this is the amount of DNA for one of those people. The vertical axis, again on a logarithmic scale, is the likelihood ratio. So the scale, as you're seeing, is going 1,000, million, and so on, or 3, 6, 9, 12, the number of zeros after the one. This log-log relationship is showing that the amount of information as you go from about one cell keeps increasing until you hit the full information value, which is 1 over the random match probability, and then a the problem solved. It's predictable. Uh, we used this in our first admissibility hearing in 2009. Scientists and judges like scientific laws. And this has been repeated over and over. So that's one useful thing from this paper. Uh, this was a study we did with the crime lab uh, in 2011. Uh, here, what we're showing on eight sexual assault cases of two-person mixtures. In orange, on the bottom of the slide, for each of these eight cases, from left to right, that's the amount of information. Most of these axes are the log likelihood ratio. So you're getting about a million, a trillion, six, 12, 18, on the y-axis, how many zeros in the number. This cluster is showing that's the amount of information from human review with thresholds. It's about six zeros. At this point in time, CPI was giving around six zeros or a million on almost all cases. Again, it's not measuring information, it's measuring loci. And the height of these two peaks are two independent computer runs with children. So we're seeing first that the numbers are close to each other. And because they're close, that means children is reproducible when it's run. And also the numbers are many log units higher. And when we looked at all eight of these cases, on average, true allele was getting, whenever a person could get a number, true allele's number was about six zeros or a million times more. This study looked at many things, sensitivity, uh, specificity, reproducibility. It also did a comparison with human review. What you're seeing from left to right are 85 cases sorted by decreasing information. So on the top left, is the most informative true allele value, the most informative log likelihood ratio. That's around 24 zeros, or a trillion trillion. Those numbers decrease as you move down. The average is 15 zeros, uh, which is about a quadrillion. And without going into the details, you can read the paper. I, I want to tell you about cases. What this showed is that when the computer got information, 70% of the time, human review failed completely the result was inconclusive. These are simpler two and three person mixtures. You can expect from an excellent lab, with good data, excellent analysts, 70% failure of what the computer truly will find relative to people. Uh, this study was five unknown contributors. We did it with the California lab. And what it's showing is whether it's high template or low template DNA, two, three, four, five contributors, the behavior on this plot of the amount of DNA versus the amount of information is giving the same slope response. Statistically, an analysis of covariance, it makes no difference how much DNA is there or how many contributors when you're looking at how the DNA of one contributor affects the amount of information. Again, many other things we're measuring in this paper. I'm just looking for greatest hits in the interest of time. Uh, this paper was done uh, with Dr. Nasir Butt uh, at the Cleveland lab. It showed many, many things. The looking at up to 10 unknown contributors. Uh, the paper won a minor award. It's a noteworthy paper for the other findings. 
but something that's interesting on the left ta table, the bottom here, is that even with 10 unknown contributors, it's considered to be impossible with any other technology. Uh, what we found was that their lab running their system gave the same answers as our lab running our system. So independently, we were able to get the same answer. I'm not giving a lecture on this paper, so I will move on. Something else that's important for courts and maybe important for India for how you end up reporting to judges, something we'll be talking about this afternoon in some meetings, is the ability to calculate error rates. A likelihood ratio is not an error rate. It's a ratio of two probabilities. It shows the change in information, the change of one probability to another. That's very important. Not a probability. It's a measure of match strength. It's the change from randomness to evidence. That's, that's what it's measured. To measure error takes more work. I will not go into it now. This is a half hour lecture. But the way you do it is you can, for if you have an inclusionary statistic like a million, you can compare against thousands of samples and get an estimated error rate. But what if you could compare against everyone on Earth? or every possible genotype according to its distribution in the population. How can you compare in a hundredth of a second against a trillion, trillion reference genotypes? This paper and the associated patents describe how to do that at very high resolution. Once you work out the distribution of match statistics on an evidence item, you can then look at a defendant's match statistic. The area of the curve is telling you the chance of making a mistake the chance that it's somebody else at that level. We always report that now. I think that will have scope for India. It turns out in this paper, the same method can be used for validations. Um, to instantaneous, instantaneous, we use genotype probabilities. And that can reduce validation time from a year to weeks, because all the calculations are done automatically in 10 days. All right. Now I'm going to talk about California versus Lopez. I, it's been so long since I mentioned this case. Some of you may have felt, even though it was only half an hour, that, that this has been eons that have gone by listening to all this, especially the lawyers, sorry. Um, but this is reminding you about the case. A man, young man, is accused of the rape and murder of his girlfriend's toddler son. And there's a rectal swab from the boy's uh, from his bottom that shows semen, it matches the defendant's DNA. What happened? What did the lab find? What did Trulio find? What were the puzzles that we were asking? The questions we couldn't solve for half a year trying to understand. And then at the last minute, days before trial, in long discussions, looking at some transcripts, we saw what the answer was. I could tell you what the answer is, but that would be boring when you leave. So instead, I'll show you what we found. This is what we showed the jury. I'm stressing this is how we teach juries. We'll typically take 30 to 45 minutes, depending on the jury and the lawyers. We spend a lot of time teaching the lawyers. We have materials for them. We meet with them. Uh, and I won't go through this slowly. I can send you actually talks where we go through this more slowly for training lawyers. We begin by explaining DNA biology the concept of cells, the human body is made of trillions of cells. There are 23 pairs of chromosomes. They come from parents. It's important when you talk about genotypes that there's two alleles. Where do they come from? Mother and father. And how DNA is text. This is something that you all know as scientists and the public generally doesn't know. It's text that can be read by the molecular machinery inside a cell, either in nature or by a scientist. We use metaphors to talk about what is a shorthand and repeat, what is an SDR marker. The kits have evolved from four markers now to about 25 over the last 25 years. What is it? We use the metaphor of an encyclopedia having 23 volumes, one for each chromosome. And then we show what a paragraph in one of those volumes might look like to represent an STR witness. Depending on how excited the lawyer gets, sometimes they get very excited and this goes on for a while. We encourage them to move on, but they don't. 
um, we can introduce the notion of an allele as the number of times a word, four, usually four letters, A, C, G, T, whatever it is, but root. So this, everybody in America knows the baseball song. Mothers must sing it to them in the womb. They all know the song. Take me out to the ball game. So this is very easy for America. Here is the idea is that the variation that occurs in nature that we're trying to measure is in the number of repeats. That word repeat on this slide, uh, the repeated word root, you're seeing 10 times. But when there's variation at an SPR locus, it could be repeated 6, 7, 8, 12, 18. Usually there's about 15 different variants of different lengths. So we first show them that because the data is going to involve different lengths. It's good for them to know. We start talking about variation, and then we teach them what is a genotype. Simple genotype. What does it mean? Uh, you know what it means. You've got a pair of alleles and an autosomal genetic locus, uh, and that pair of alleles, internal and internal, is a genotype at one locus, but by educating the court that uh, there's about a hundred possible allele pairs, that's roughly 15 times 15 divided by 2, because the order doesn't matter, um, there's a lot of variation that we're measuring. So there's differences between people. And when you look at 10 or 20 or 25 loci, you get to multiply those possibilities together, and there's a trillion, trillion, trillion genotypes. We use a barcode metaphor, but only eight billion people. So genotypes are relatively rare. We explain that. We then talk about simple evidence interpretation for single source DNA. On the left is DNA. We explain the laboratory will extract DNA, it will amplify, and then detect on a genetic analyzer. In the center is data. This is a cartoon, I'm not showing background noise, stutter, relevant. Juries are not really interested in that. You can tell them, cross them down, but what is the data? It's the sizing data. The molecule with 10 is shorter than the molecule with 12. So we're seeing on a scale of left to right, a 10 allele is detected by the genetic analyzer. The 12 allele is detected and in a perfect world, nothing else is detected. So obviously, one can infer from this. I've run courses, uh, one of my children, when they was third grade, he said, I've signed you up. You're giving DNA talks uh, to my camp. It's a science camp. I've been giving you the morning. So, but what I found is third graders understand that if I see a 10 and a 12, the genotype's a 10. 